This interview was recorded at the home of Dr. Hassan Najafi in Northfield, Illinois. Good morning. I am uh, Bill Baker, and to my right is uh, Jimmy Yao. We have been uh, charged by the Society of Vascular Surgery, uh, mostly through Dr. Yao's committee, to obtain an oral history not only of vascular surgery, but of the individuals that contributed uh, much to our specialty. Today, we are very privileged to be interviewing Hassan Najafi. Dr. Najafi not only is a superb surgeon and a very accomplished thoracic-vascular surgeon uh, in, uh, in our city, but uh, we hope to gain from him some of the insights about the early days of Rush. We're in Rush was truly pioneering in this field. Uh, Hassan, good morning. Good morning, Bill. Tell us about yourself. Where were you born? I was born in Tehran, Iran on May 22nd, 1930. I just celebrated my 82nd birthday and I thank God for it. And before anything else, I want to pay a tribute to my father. Even though he did not have formal education, he could write and read, but never went to school. He wanted, he had two wishes for me. One was to become a physician, and the other one was to marry a Westerner. And the second dictum uh, was difficult for me to understand, but he explained it. And the way he explained it was, he said he had two businesses. One was a small, a small dairy farm, and the other one was uh, building a few houses in a row and selling them. And in his dairy farm, he would have someone deliver milk, which wasn't pasteurized, to individuals, to, fa to families. And he would go every month to collect the money. And in doing so, he came upon at least half a dozen European ladies who responded to the door. And he said every time he met one of them, they were impeccable, they were well-dressed, they were poised, they were nice, and so forth. So that is where the origin of his desire for me to marry a Westerner at that time America wasn't really vogue in Iran, or Americans. People went to Switzerland from Iran, to Germany, and to England. But I happened to accomplish both of them. When I graduated, number one, from the medical school in Tehran, University School of Medicine, there were some 240 graduates. I was number one, or at the top of the class. And shortly thereafter, the king of Iran decided that we should have individuals sent abroad for superior training. And uh, again, abroad was Europe. But when my time came, I decided I want to come to the United States. And I came to Washington, D.C., having had one year of internship in Iran and two years of residency. And I had a wonderful letter in my pocket, which was to me the greatest thing I had, my greatest possession. And it was a letter from John H. Gibbon, the chairman of surgery at Jefferson Medical College. And I knew about him. And the reason I knew about him was when I was a resident in surgery in 1953, John Gibbon, shattered the world with the news that he had just used his heart lung machine that he and his wife had worked on for 20 years to develop it, to close a defect, atrial septal defect, in a teenager in the United States. And that letter, therefore, was what I brought to the United States. He gave me a first year residency 
at Jefferson Medical College beginning July of 1957. Mm. I came to the United States in March, and uh, the very first thing I wanted to do was to meet Dr. Gibbon. So I went to Greyhound bus, got in the bus, <laughs> went to Philadelphia, went to Jefferson Medical College. This was in middle of March, one of the coldest days of my life. Snow and wind and cold. I went to his office and they told me that Dr. Gibbon was in the uh, laboratory. I didn't know what kind of laboratory. They told me just walk through the corridor. There is a door, open that. There is a metal grill that connects this building with the next building. <laughs> you walk on the grill, be careful because there is wind going through and there are no rails. <laughs> this is really true. So I did that and I remember I stood there for a long time uh, deciding whether I was going to go through successfully or I was going to topple over. But somehow I made over a cross and went and met Dr. Gibbon. And he had just operated on a dog, a huge dog, done one of his you know, research projects. And when we went to his office and sat down, he said, uh, Doctor, I liked your uh, curriculum vita. You have done well. And we have um, a position for you here uh, to, do, to become a general surgeon here, if that's what your uh, wish is. But uh, I feel because of your uh, uh, deficiency in English language and because you are not familiar with the way we do things, we feel that it would be good for you to spend a year in the dog lab. And right there, I knew that <laughs> I was not going to be at Jefferson Medical College, but I remained polite and I said that I will communicate with him and left. And when I was returning to Washington, D.C., I knew that I didn't have anything. As I said, it was in March, and July 1st was around the corner. But somehow I managed to go to George Washington University Hospital, where Brian Blades, mm -hmm. who was the chairman of the American Board of Thoracic Surgery at the time and had a huge name, he and his colleagues, his associate professors, interviewed me, and at the end they offered me an inter surgical internship at George Washington University Hospital, which I appeared on the 1st of July. And that is how my training in the United States uh, was initiated. In this country, at this time, of course, you say your father was uh, building houses and had a little farm, but uh, describe your, the house that you grew up in so that uh, the listeners get an idea of, of the circumstances of... Uh... Uh, we had a very beautiful house. In Iran, most houses, almost all, are walled in, as you know, mm -hmm. as you may have seen. And I discovered the same thing in Mexico City when I decades later visited there. So we were uh, on a street, or on a lane rather, that cars didn't go through, and from that lane there was a tiny lane uh, perpendicular to this one, and there were two houses in that, pre that short, narrow lane. We were on the right side, and there was another family on the left side. Our house was walled in. It was a L-shaped in terms of the rooms. On the left side, there were four rooms, two down, two down first floor and two upper floor. And on the, the other side, right side, there were five rooms. So there was a corner room and there were four again. That, and that is where we lived. My father and mother ended up having seven children. The first, I'm the first son, but the second child. I had an older sister who sadly passed away a few years ago. And uh, we were then three, three boys and three g girls remaining. And um, I lived in that house. I had my own room. And my studying uh, in medical school was the most important thing to my parents. 
And I was treated uh, exceptionally well, making sure that I get, got enough rest and, and I was, the house was quiet so I could study. And I remember studying in the house, in the yard, going around and around by the trees and the bushes, memorizing things and so on. And we had a magnificent peach tree about which I have written. And <laughs> I would eat it before the peaches were ripe <laughs> until they were overripe. <laughs> it was a magnificent tree. And that is where, where I lived. It was a most wonderful upbringing. One thing that might interest you is, as I said, we were seven of us siblings. My uh, mother was pregnant with the seventh. And I came home late at night from a long dinner. And when I walked in, the, I noticed a lot of commotion. And my sister ran to me and said, our mother is going having the baby. And the baby, the lady who was supposed to come to deliver the baby could not come. You have to do it. And I had just graduated from medical school. <laughs> So here I am, I'd never seen my mother, you know, ex, you know they're, in, they're in Iran, they're very discreet. <laughs> and so I didn't like the idea, but I ended up delivering my sister. And when I received her, I said, here is a baby girl and her name is Nahid. And put her down next to her. Cut the umbilical cord and then my sister began to uh, clean her and so on and put some clothes on her. She is now an execu a high executive, in a high executive position uh, in uh, technology and internet, one of the first uh, Iranian to achieve uh, expertise in, in the internet and uh, new technology. Lives in uh, Chevy Chase, Maryland with her husband uh, and she has, she, she has a son and grandson. So that is the story of our family. So then you did your internship at George Washington, uh, and that obviously went well, and somehow you made it to uh, Chicago. Yes, what happened was, the reason I came to the United States was the main reason I wanted to become an orthopedic surgeon. And the reason I wanted to become an orthopedic surgeon was because twice I dislocated my elbows. First the right one, and then the next one left on. And twice these were reduced by a butcher, man who sold meat. <laughs> because we didn't have surgeon or physician or at least my family or where we lived in Tehran and so on. And the second time the man nearly, I nearly had syncope because it was so incredibly painful. The results turned out to be excellent. But I said to myself, I'm going to the United States on a scholarship given by the country. I want to become an orthopedic surgeon and come back and introduce the uh, technology of, new technology of orthopedic surgery in Iran and hopefully happy when patients come from other country, surrounding countries, you know. That was the philosophy. All right, so how did you get to Chicago? And what happens, while I was there, I applied for uh, orthopedic surgery at D.C. General Hospital, which mm -hmm. was in Washington, D.C. And the chairman of orthopedic surgery came from George Wash Georgetown, not George Washington. Mm -hmm. He covered the Department of uh, Orthopedic Surgery. And they uh, gave me, or at least I found out that I was sec one of two residents, and uh, I was number two. And I'm not going to go into that, how I found that. And uh, so I was delighted. In fact, I remember when I was told that, I spent every dollar I had taking friends out and celebrating. But what happened, a couple of days later, I received a letter that said, we regret to inform you. I received many of those letters in the United States because I didn't have a residency. And what happened was a fellow who had been a resident in surgery there, American, Meanwhile, I applied and promptly they pushed me as an alternate mm. and gave the second job to the other person. And that I was very upset about. So I started looking. And uh, in looking, I got a, an invitation for interview at St. Luke's Hospital, mm -hmm. and which I came out. I flew out to Chicago 
and met the chairman of surgery and his uh, another gentleman, Dr. Witkowski. And Dr. Witkowski was an outstanding general surgeon and a very highly respected. And he, they, I was sent to him to be interviewed. So I went upstairs to the floor where he was and I walked out of the elevator and he was teaching residents, the senior resident and others. And I was walking towards the, where he was standing with the others. While I was walking, I noticed something under the table, under the patient's bed rather. And it was a jar. And the jar was two-thirds full of uh, secretion with a nasogastric tube attached to it. And that jarred my brain right away because a few days earlier, mm -hmm. on Friday, in grand rounds at George Washington University Hospital, they presented the first case of um, zollinger ellison syndrome. And I, that somehow imprinted in my mind, had an indelible impression of it. So as I walked over there, and he received me warmly and shook hands, he introduced the residents, and he says the chief resident is giving uh, the history of this patient, and um, so join us, and maybe you can contribute to this uh, man's, was an old gentleman. And, and I was so excited and rather impolite. I said, can I ask a question? <laughs> and he said, you certainly may. I said, how long this, what this amount of fluid or volume of fluid in this bottle? It was during what period of time? And one of the junior residents said, this is since midnight. And, and I said, I wonder if this patient has Zollinger, Zollinger Ellison <laughs> syndrome. And he looked at the chief resident, he said, we covered everything except Zollinger Ellison syndrome. The first case was presented at my hospital, George Washington, in Washington, by, uh, by a resident from Zollinger, by Ellison, Dr. Ellison's resident. So that was fortuitous, and it really was the very first and most important platform from which I just took off. Well, then you went to finished your general surgery, uh, started at St. Luke's and then uh, went to uh, Rush when the hospitals merged. Exactly. Re Presbyterian Hospital in St. Luke's merged uh, on, on July 1st, 1959. The entire uh, uh, St. Luke's moved to, to Rush. And uh, it was at Rush that I met Dr. Beatty, who was the uh, Chairman of Surgery. Mm -hmm. have, here is his picture, ah. Dr. Beatty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then as a 30 resident, I was, um, I was assigned to Dr. Julian's service. Julian had only two associates at the time. First, he hired Dr. Dai, and Dr. Dai, after staying with Orman Julian, and they were unknown, and they were doing varicose veins, amputation, and um, minor vascular surgery at Heinz VA Hospital, mm -hmm. as well as another hospital. I want to say Mercy Hospital, mm -hmm. but I, it could be different. It was one of the small community hospitals. And apparently, they didn't make enough money, so Sam left Ormond. But then uh, the Javid joined Ormond. And they, they, he was a resident there at the University of Illinois, up, outstanding in every respect, and also at St. Luke's. And I remember when Javid did a closed circuit resection of abdominal aortic aneurysm and insertion of a bifurcation graft that actually Ormond, you know, had a seamstress to make it for him. I think I brought, there is one over there, I to show it to you. Uh, and uh, so Javid, uh, really was the big, uh, started the beginning of resection aneurysm, although in 1952, years earlier, Orman Julian had a patient who had ruptured the aneurysm, and they opened the abdomen and found that it was ruptured, there was periaortic hematoma, and they clamped the aorta above and below and took the, uh, opened the aneurysm, took it out, which was a bloody mess because of the veins and everything bleeding and so on. And now they didn't know what to do because you know there was no continuity. So they used a dermatome. 
and took a piece of skin from the anterior aspect of the patient's thigh, you know, taking the drapes, <laughs> shaving and abetadine or iodine and so on. And now they didn't know which side they should be inside, <laughs> the hairy side <laughs> or the, <laughs> the outside. So finally they put it in. Sadly, the patient is sloughed that in a matter of 24 hours or less and exsanguinated and, and died. That was the first resection of the aneurysm. It attempted the first, first resection of the aneurysm. So I remember how inspired I was when I met Dr. Julian and Javid, and then Sam Dai came back. Mm -hmm. And as I said, he's a, he was a prince of a gentleman. He was the best friend of the residents. He was very generous. He preferred to help rather than to, to do the surgery himself. And I don't really remember a single case he did with me. I remember when the very first cavity is scrubbed in, and I'm standing there next to the table on the assistant side with his foot open the door. He said, Hassan, we don't have bashful surgeons on this service. <laughs> and let the door close. And I went the other side. And he came in and helped me do the surgery. So Sam Dye was a prince of a person, a great teacher. Tell me about Orman Julian. Orman Julian, the best way to describe him is he was a luminary. He was, I, I can't say enough about Orman Julian. He was also an outstanding surgeon. I just loved watching him operate. And in fact, sometimes I preferred if he did the surgery as opposed to me doing the surgery. And he was an excellent teacher it's at the bedside, especially making diagnosis and so on. And the very first time I saw Orman was, um, I was in the operating room helping Sam die with surgery. I forget what it was. And suddenly I'd never seen him by then. We was just, I'd just been there maybe for a short period of time, a few weeks maybe. I had no reason to have run into him. And then at that time, the operating room doors were open. People came upstairs on a street close through the corridors of the operating room. And we were in old St. Luke's, which is still standing. And we were, I believe, on the 13th floor. It's a 14-story building. And the operating rooms were in the, on the 13th floor. And I'm helping Sam and so on. And suddenly, a voice showed, came in, said, Sam, and Sam turned around to the right, and I turned to the left from across the table. And here was Dr. Julian. And he said, Sam, I saw everybody's patients today except ours. <laughs> when you are done, make rounds. <laughs> and he walked away. And that made an impression on me because the resident that he went around with, Bob DeMarco, was my roommate. The two of us were in one small room in the hospital. That was our, where we slept, where we lived, and so on. And that immediately told me that Mark DeMarco was in trouble. And in fact, subsequently, he was not allowed to become a second or go further. So when I met around with Dr. Julian then, because it was my turn to do it, I came in the hospital at 5.30 in the morning went around and got all of the information I needed about, because I didn't know many of those patients. And when Orman came to make rounds, uh, I went to the, at that time there were no, uh, it was a rudimentary um, communication system in the hospital. You know, the loudest speaker, you know, would say, Dr. Julian, you know, the page and so on. And I decided that I would meet Dr. Julian to take him on rounds instead of for him to look for me. So I went to the door that went to the, to the parking lot. And I stood there. And there was a lady there sitting on a chair next to the wall with a big, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, book. And had names of the surgeons written on the top and says, in, out. It, and I stood there and I said, is Dr. Julian in? He said, no, not yet. We are expecting him any time. And sure enough, he walked in. When he walked in, I walked over and introduced myself. I said, I'm ready to make rounds with you if you wish. He said, can I have a cup of coffee first? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sure. So we went to the, the little uh, the, the coffee shop in the same floor. And he ordered two cups of coffee. 
And I said, I don't drink coffee. He said, how long have you been in the United States? <laughs> I said, over a year almost. He said, it's time you start drinking coffee. <laughs> 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 so he had his, <laughs> and I had difficulty. I must have two or three times <laughs> trying to. So I took him on rounds, and that is, I made an impression on him. And then ruined that impression two days later on rounds. <laughs> What happened was we went to the patient's bed, and I thought I knew everything about that patient from the stem to the stem. And uh, he, uh, I, I presented the patient to him, and he knew the patient because he had sent him in. He said, uh, what is his blood pressure? I said, it is 120 over 80. He said, which arm? I said, the right arm. He said, how about the left arm? And I sweat, sweat. <laughs> all over my body. I said, I didn't check, because I didn't know you checked both arms on a vascular service. I had not yet been savvy enough to realize that vascular surgery means vessels everywhere, <laughs> not just the right arm. And so he said, would you like to do it now? I said, sure. So I got the, 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 the blood pressure cuff and put it on the patient's arm and inflated it and kept going down. <laughs> I wouldn't hear anything. Uh, and I said, finally, I said, I can't hear a pressure. He said, well, you know why you can't hear the pressure? I said, there must be a blockage, proximally. He said, where do you think the blockage is? And I said, um, I went up to the, the screen, dropped it and felt the axilla. I couldn't feel the axilla. Went to the superior, supraclavicular region and put my finger there and barely could feel a pulse. And the patient had this, what do you call it, the uh, subclavian is still syndrome, and getting retrograde flow from the vertebral artery. And that taught me a lesson, to be more careful and more precise and complete when examining a patient. He was very kind about it and very nice about it, but that's how he taught. He had, Orman probably had the greatest presence than anyone I have met in my life, including the king of Iran. He was amazing. When he walked on the floor, I mean, it's just you could tell Orman Julian was on the floor walking. It's amazing, brilliant in every way. Outstanding surgeon, great teacher, and I can't say enough about Orman Julian. We all loved him. So did Marsha. Well, as you're group uh, came through these times, they became a premier cardiac surgical group as well as a vascular group. Uh, was there any rhyme or reason for this, or does it just kind of come about? It came about. about. And what happened was there was a patient who had uh, mitral stenosis, a lady, and she um, the, developed pulmonary edema because the mitral stenosis was severe. And Orman Julian did a mitral camisurotomy on him. That's the first cardiac operation I remember that Orman did. And uh, I stayed with that patient all night, checking the blood pressure every 15, 20 minutes. I was sort of very worried. Mm -hmm. If something happens to that patient, you know, it would be my fault. Fortunately, she continued to do well, and it was a successful closed mitral camisurotomy. I don't mean to imply that that was the first commissurotomy he did because he was at Heinz and he was another hospital. And I'm sure he had done it before. But it was a finger fracture of the mitral valve through a small left anterolateral thoracotomy. With or without a glove? Uh, well, he, he used glove, but there were surgeons that would, they would remove the index part of the glove, which, you know, to use their nail better. I never did that, and I never saw others doing that. But you are very astute to remember that. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that means. Yeah. Uh, so through the years, you became involved with uh, thoracic surgery. Uh, uh, in the, you became the, the president of the board, chairman of the board. I felt that if you were a surgeon, and all you did was taking, or physician, to start from a physician and, or a surgeon, and all you did was take care of patients. That was a magnificent uh, thing to do. 
and probably good enough for most people who want to be a physician. But I saw in Orman and others that there are other things you can do to make yourself more complete, such as do research. I became very interested in doing research, did a tremendous amount of research in dogs, taking the heart out and putting it back in, then from one dog to another. Write, go to meetings, and teach. So because I wanted to be as complete surgeon, I decided that I would invest more time, and I did invest more time. From the time I graduated from medical school in 1954 until I saw my first patient in practice, it was 10 years. So I went beyond all of this. And, uh, and since then, as a, as a physician, surgeon, and then later as assistant professor, associate, and then chairman, and so on, I insisted and encouraged the residents going through the training program, go as far as you can go. And that is why uh, there are uh, 56 residents that were trained under my watch as director and chairman. Then uh, that to me is my uh, professional legacy. This is the most precious of all the things I have, the, nice. the faculty is in the middle, and all of the residents who finished, which is general surgery followed by three years. Now in 1987, I applied and got approval for isolated, freestanding vascular surgery training program in my cardiovascular thoracic program. There were only two, I believe, or three in the entire United States. One of them is Robichek. Right. He had that. You may know another one, but I don't. And I was given that, um, that privilege, and I took advantage of it and promptly told the residents who would be applying, I would say, you have choices after general surgery. You can spend two years and then do thoracic and cardiac surgery, but if you are willing, after the two years, you can spend a year, additional year, as vascular resident, or vice versa, first year of vascular, and then two years. And many uh, that you saw there wanted that. And, and one of them, John Jonathan Summers, who is in Chicago, is, uh, I meet with him often because we have become very close friends. And he is so grateful that he was in a program that had vascular surgery, because that's 50% of his practice. And because of vascular surgery, quickly my program became the most desired throughout the United States, because people wanted that. Uh, they go to a smaller community places, 250,000 population. They could do all three of these, instead of sending patients to other major medical centers. And I consider that as uh, one of the uh, nicest things that happened in our program at, at Rush. Well, you were involved in a lot of those, uh, for the lack of a better word, discussions or negotiations between general surgery, cardiac surgery, and as to, as to the formation of, uh, of vascular fellowships. Uh, how were those discussions conducted? Well, uh, uh, yes, I did become very involved. And um, uh, Jesse Thompson, you know of him. Yes. He was a Dallas, I believe. Dallas wanted. and Baylor. Uh, Jesse uh, Thompson and I were um, given by Society for Vascular Surgery and International Cardiovascular Society. We were asked to look into uh, the issue of vascular surgery as a freestanding specialty. Mm -hmm. And he and I met uh, two or three times. And in, within the next few months, uh, they, they changed their, uh, the folks who asked us to look into that. They felt that um, it was not the greatest idea to immediately, you know, just cut off the vascular surgery and make it a freestanding specialty. We wrote 
all of the special, re uh, special and uh, general requ requirements for that. And it was published, but it never was approved by the major organizations to do that. So as a result, then, uh, we continued to have vascular surgeons and cardiothoracic surgeons. And in the meeting, I was very vocal about vascular surgery no longer being an appendage, but rather being a specialty of itself, be respected as such, would have its own uh, certificate and so on. And when good things happened, for some reason, I uh, became a little um, uh, instrumental through the American Board of Medical Specialties the gentleman who headed that, for some reason, he and I became very close friends and trust, trustworthy to each other, and uh, he helped. And I said, vascular surgery deserves to, to, be, to have its own independent uh, certificate. And then others uh, stepped in, and finally, we decided to give, uh, vascular surgery decided to give or the board, the board of surgery, decided to give vascular surgery. And I remember I had to go down to St. Louis and Willard Fry, Hal Urschel, and have a, Hal Level from Salt Lake City. There were a dozen of us. We went down there and took the exam, written and, <laughs> and written exam, and that's why my vascular surgery certificate is number 11. I think Willard Fry, I got the number one on his certificate. And that is how it became really a full-fledged specialty to itself and deserved it. Well, I can imagine there was some contentiousness among some of your colleagues in cardiothoracic surgery uh, who really wanted it to be part of their uh, division and didn't want to have it separated. Uh, there was, but on the other hand, I remember when I became the uh, president of the Thoracic Surgery Directors Association, yes. which I'm considered to be the, the, as they say, the founder or father, or whatever you call it. And I gave it that name because it drives in very nice with the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, ABTS, and so on. I, as a, as a president of that organization, and I really put it on the map, 90% of the directors came to the meeting on a Saturday. And it was a full-fledged meeting all morning, all afternoon. And I ran it. And, and, um, and they, at the end, they, they made me president the next year, so two years. At the end of two years, I gave a talk. Yes, you know, you had to give, uh -huh. I wouldn't call it an address, but it was a fairly uh, long talk with all sorts of you know, uh, slides and so on. Tom Ferguson was the editor of the um, so, so uh, Annals of Thoracic Surgery, the sister with the, uh, the other journal, AATS. And um, uh, Ferguson asked me if I would put it together, he would publish that, which he did in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, all of the things that I suggested that vascular surgery has got to do in order to, to reach a level that is an independent uh, independent specialty, and that became successful. As I said, some 90% of the directors came to the meeting and, uh, and they sponsored that. That's how it, that came about. I think in the 60s, you know, the Ross group was really dominating vascular surgery in Chicago. I started in 72, I just wished I get more chance to know Almond Julian. I know Sam Dye better, and I really uh, grateful for Sam's advice and and his help. And tell me more about Almond Julian. Well, Almond Julian, um, uh, pr sadly, uh, developed coronary artery disease. And I remember one day uh, we all received a call. There were six of us now in the group. It was Du, Julian, Dai, Javid, Hunter, Najafi, and uh, then there were Ma Weinberg and Monson who were there. It was a sizable group in the entire department. We were all asked to meet him in his uh, office. 
And uh, when we were going to the office in the elevator, there were half a dozen of us in the elevator, there was a speculation as to why he is inviting everybody to meet with him at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And one person said, well, maybe uh, he's, um, he's re he wants to retire. Another person said maybe he had a chest x-ray this morning and they found something serious. And this went on and on, on and on. So finally when we met him and he appeared and sat down, uh, he t looked at everyone and he said, um, I have decided to uh, step down uh, as the chairman and uh, director of the program. And then he went around the table and he said, uh, I remember he said to Sam, he said, you're too old. <laughs> 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 and, and went one by one, and I happened to be sitting here, and Orman was there, and another person was here. And he reached to me, and he said, I suggest that we consider Hassan take this job, because uh, he's interested in all aspects of the specialty, not just operating, and uh, the uh, teaching, the research and so on and so forth. And uh, that's how uh, it happened. And one other thing helped me immensely was in December of 67, a heart transplant was done in Groot Schumer by the, uh, what was his name? Oh, in uh, South Africa? South Africa. Chris, Chris uh, Barnard. Chris, Chris Barnard. Barnard. Yeah. He did the heart transplant. Just to show you how, or, how forward Ormond was, immediately after that, he said, we ought to do a heart transplant at Rush. And um, Jim Campbell was president, and he was a very powerful and um, very uh, yeah. dictatorial kind of a, a CEO. You know all about him. And uh, he uh, told Orman, he said, we have so many other far more important things to do uh, unless you're interested in dancing with Chido Lola Brigida. <laughs> Remember, he went there for Barnard and, and did that. So he was not very eager to, for Orman to decide to do it. But after, on April, four months later, uh, we had a patient that was going to die. And Ormond again, you know, manipulated that we should do him. And I ended up operating on Erwin Kramer, who was the first one. He was six foot four, weighed 124 pounds, his skin and bones. And I, in fact, first time turned him down because he wasn't even conscious. He could, could, could not, you know, he was just um, not comatose, but he just wasn't with it totally. But after a few months, he improved. And in December of 1968, we did the heart transplant on Erwin Kramer. Sadly, he lived, he lived, he gained weight, he became 187 pounds at the end and really looked wonderful. But one day, he had a right heart failure due to rejection because we did not have drugs for rejection. We were using a steroid only. And he died four months after surgery. Then there was a moratorium came from Canada by the surgeon there at their Canada Heart Institute uh, of, in Canada. And uh, he put a moratorium on because they had seven patients all died. And then Tunkuli did seven patients, all, they all died within six or seven months. So the moratorium went on for four years or five years later when cyclosporine was introduced to the drug regimen, and that revolutionized heart transplantation. Mm -hmm. Now it became almost 90% successful for quite some time, many years. And when that became available, there was a fellow by the name of Richard Engels at Rush in the intensive care unit. And one of the surgeons was taking care of him, Milton Weinberg. And he asked me to take a look at the Richard Engels. And I went to the room. His wife followed me. And the wife was wonderful, and that made an impression on me because if you have a heart transplant, you better have someone to look after you. Sean Bay, I remember, used to say that if a person doesn't have a family to, take a to look after him, heart transplant should not be done, and he was absolutely right. 
Richard Engels had had four previous heart operations and he was extremely ill, uh, swollen all over and so on. And uh, I decided to put him on the list, which I did. And uh, we listed him for, for surgery, and, um, but we had to wait quite a, quite a while. One thing that Rush did, which I respected immensely, was they told me that uh, they were going to establish two committees, high-powered committees of the most respected and uh, most uh, experienced physicians and surgeons in the hospital. One group, one committee will look into safeguarding the recipient, whoever the recipient might be in the future to receive a heart transplant. And the other committee would be safeguarding the donor. And I was not allowed to be on either one. I was invited to be on, uh, on the recipient side, but on the, on the other side, for, for the donor, I would have felt that there was a conflict of interest because I was eager, they, they realized I was really wanted to get the program going and I might cut corners in terms of donor, which I would have never done. But at any rate, uh, we, did, we listed uh, Mr. Engels for surgery, and, and I could not know or see the, the donor, prospective donor. He was about to die, really. One or two more days he would have died. And a circle, and totally out, and so on. I was very unsure. And Jim Hunter adamantly telling me that you are operating on him with all of these drugs you are going to put him on, he's going to get infection, and he's going to die, and we'll be embarrassed. And I said, Jim, he'll stay on because he's going to die. And what's death you know, now or death without surgery? He's got a bit surgery. He has a chance. And one night, late at night, I got a call at 11 o'clock that there is a donor in Indianapolis, a young man, 28-year-old, who was on a motorcycle and apparently crashed, and he was brain dead. And I sent Cyrus Seri, whom you know, and... Uh, uh, on a helicopter, and he went down there and got the heart. And we brought Mr. Engels to the operating room to, as a recipient to get him going. And when I went to open the sternum, uh, I was told that uh, it's, he had had four previous operations that I knew, but the last one he had, a lot of Teflon was used here and there as they were operating on his heart. It took me a long time to remove the heart, long after the heart had arrived in a bucket of ice water. And, um, but I put it in, and it took only an hour to implant. The actual technique of implanting the heart in place, if a person is familiar with the technique, had been in the lab and had seen it and so on, uh, it's really not a big operation. And I sewed the heart in, an hour later came off bypass, and that heart was unbelievable. It maintained magnificent circulation. And Engel's post-operative course was totally uneventful, with one exception. The, night after, the second night after surgery, I was awakened telling me, this general, general surgery resident telling me that con they consulted the general surgery resident, that he has a board-like abdomen. And I immediately thought of gastric perforation, and peritonitis. And I remember in bed, I, I just shriveled down to a 10 pounds in terms of size and weight and feelings and emotions. It was just, uh, I thought, you know, Jim Hunter is going to walk all over me. And I said, call Alex Doulas, who was the best general surgeon at Rush, and tell Alex to see him and call me right away. Alex Doulas saw him. And I couldn't wait. I finally called him. I said, Alex, have you seen him? He said, yeah, I'm li looking at him. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, his abdomen is rigid, but he's not, he's not uh, board-like. I said, please, take him to the operating room immediately and explore him, which they, he did. And he called me back, and he said, there is no perforation. There is no peritonitis. There is some fluid in the abdomen. I said, please close and return him to the, uh, to the room. And after that, everything was totally uh, straightforward, and he went on to recover, 
and um, did well and lived 17 years. He was 53 year old when I did him and he died when he was 70 year old and died of renal failure, not cardiac. His heart was perfectly fine. The almond durian favor vascular surgery as independent specialty? I don't think he ever got involved in that process. I remember he wrote some editorial about it. He, he was, he he was, was not really keen on that. He was president, yeah, he was president of the International Cardiovascular Society, not Society for Vascular Surgery. So he retained his feelings as he had them. They hated to see that vascular surgery will be taken away, and because it wasn't a strong and large and powerful specialty, it may suffer. You're right. But by the time I got involved, things had changed. It's changed yeah. And by the way, the reason I became chairman is because Orman developed a second heart attack. And when he developed a second heart attack, uh, he called me at home. His, Rosemary, his wife, called me. And he said he wants to see you. And he lived in Winnetka, which was very close to my house. And I promptly went over there and, uh, and followed his, the ambulance from his home to the hospital. And when we took him there, and uh, he was studied, and he did have a second myocardial infarction. And he badly wanted to have um, something done. He wanted to live so bad because he had so much love and for his job, for his work, for the folks he had, you know, trained, for his family and friends and so on. And I cried with him. He was in the, hmm. we went to the Cleveland Clinic. And I went to him to Cleveland Clinic. He wanted to have Mason Sons uh, do his angiograms and uh, perhaps uh, even the surgeon there, Don Effler, to do the operation. And he, I went with him. And when they studied him, and uh, he, first thing uh, Dr. Um, Effler told him when he saw him, he said, Orman, you're still smoking and you're overweight. I don't think you should have surgery. And uh, which was a very sad thing for Orman to hear. Uh, but after the study was done, Effler said, your artery is too bad and I think you should just be treated conservatively. And we came back to Chicago. And then uh, he became so, so, he had so much difficulties, he decided, he said, whether I live or not, I want to have, a, have a, an operation. And Javid operated on him and did vein graft to his coronary arteries. And he lived for a short while after that operation, but not active, not being able to do a whole lot of things, and left Chicago and as you said, went to uh, uh, Palm, Palm Desert yeah. with Rosemary and where he lived for an additional maybe year and a half or so before he passed away. Last week I went to Houston in the wheel, mm -hmm. Ken Maddox, uh -huh. Josh Noon and Jimmy Howe. Uh -huh. You know, Ken Maddox wrote a book on surgeon in Houston. Inside there, there's a story about Almond Julian and Paul Jordan. Almond want to know whether sympathectomy do anything good for collocation. So he talked to Paul Jordan, who was, you know, a friend of Almond. And Paul Jordan told Almond Julian, sympathetic won't do any good for collocation. And that from Orman Julian to start doing direct surgery. Is that right? Yeah. And this leads to the classic article, uh -huh. direct surgery on atherosclerosis. Yes. And that is the story in that book. Yeah. And I talked to Ken Mad Maddox about yeah. it. And this article has been quoted many times. And also Sam Dai told me, you know, all the residents need to read this. And Sam wrote me a letter when I asked him about vascular surgery in, in Rush. Yes. And he gave me the history on all the first operations done by your group, you know. Right. 
the first annual is yeah, I have a copy of that. And this article is uh, presented in American Surgical. Yes. And this became the classic. And yes. I make residents to read this. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing to do. Uh, Sam Dai, by the way, is given credit for doing the first femoral popliteal bypass. And the first time they did it, Orman said uh, they used the f common femoral vein. And he said when they took the clamps uh, off established flow, he said, I was looking at the longest <laughs> hot dog in my life in the patient's leg. <laughs> that was the last time. It was just too big and the pressure, you know, yeah. unlike saphenous vein, which is more resilient and is used to a fair amount of hydrostatic pressure, the femoral vein was very thin. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, story. There are a lot of fascinating stories about Orman and Sam Dai. I was told that Orman is always driving around to do aneurysm in different hospitals. Is yes, he did. Yes, he did. He went to uh, Westside VA, did surgery there. And he even drive down to Downstay and all some some other little hospital. I don't rem I don't remember that. You have more information on that. But uh, the first the first time they started operating, they used homologous grafts, which they took from uh, young young patients who died in accidents or otherwise. And I remember uh, I used the very last one that had left that rush because there was a patient that I did a bifurcation graft that Orman had um, a seamster, you know, making it for him. And that bifurcation graft in the, at the bifurcation bled. And I, at that time, we didn't have much of anything, Teflon and gel foam. And uh, so I had to explore him again. I explored him twice to stop the bleeding. He was a VA patient. And uh, then, uh, I decided maybe grafts don't work. I should use homologous grafts. So I called and found out that there was one left at Rush in the old uh, operating rooms that had been disbanded. I went there and I remember it was pouring rain. I could hardly see driving. I went upstairs and got the graft and drove back to Westside VA, went to the operating room and put the graft in. And when I finished the graft, it looked magnificent. I mean, it was so, we took pictures of it. It was so beautiful and uh, glistening and it, anastomosis were just right because it was homologous human graft. So I was very proud of myself. Three days later in the hospital, I was making rounds with Jim Cox, whom you may or may not know, who went to the, who left Chicago after his training. Jim Cox um, took me to, uh, to, to on rounds. So we went around making rounds and we went to this man that I had done this homologous craft. And I remember telling him, I said, you are the luckiest man on the face of the earth. He said, how so? I said, because we didn't use fabric. We didn't put, you know, the uh, cloth in your abdomen because they have tendency to uh, get infected and or get attached to the bowel and they, there are some complications. But you have a beautiful a young lady's graft, homologous graft, his hair aorta. And uh, he thanked me and so on. I left the room. We went to another room, another room and the other room. Suddenly we heard this uh, scream for this emergency and so on and bells ringing and we rushed back. It was the patient. I said, "You have the, <laughs> you have the, you're the luckiest man in the face of the earth, who now was pulseless, He's still warm, pulseless but dead." And we got an autopsy on him, and the graft had ruptured during that short interval, matter of minute or two. The anastomosis, the homologous graft, pulled away from the patient, and had massive bleeding and went on to die. There are a couple yes, other surgeons I want to ask you. How, what do you think about Geyser detectors? What are the relationship between he and Orman? And well, Geyser detectors, as you know, never did direct vascular surgery. Yeah, true. He did mostly sympathectomy. 
And sometimes sympathectomy had to be done in two stages, because I remember I was a resident. <laughs> <laughs> after an hour and a half. I didn't half, know that. <laughs> <laughs> after an hour and a half, they did a lot of dissecting through a retroperitoneal space and so on. He said, well, I think we should close and come back. <laughs> Finished. I, I love Geza de Taikot. She, she invited me to his home. He had a home on the lake. <coughs> Did you ever visited him at his home on the lake, Michigan? Not, not with him, but he was very nice to me. He took me to the tavern club for lunch. Yes, I did, the same for, yeah. did the same for Marsha and I as well. Yeah, he was nice. Very nice. I was just newly in town. He, he was a great gentleman. He was a wonderful. How about Mill Weinberg? You have um, Milton any? Weinberg again, another prince of a guy, gentleman. And Milton Weinberg did pediatric cardiac surgery and did them well. And then we had David Monson who finished his residency, and um, I wanted him to find a job somewhere because I felt that he would be a good person to start a new program in a ma major community hospital. But Milton Weinberg offered him, um, offered him the job to, to, a stay, to a stay at Rush, which he did. And um, Geza de Takets, going back to Geza de Takets, uh, he was really a friend of residents and um, truly a gentleman. How about Edgar Fell? You, you have any? I never had any. The contact with him and um, uh, either as a resident or as an attending or, or for that matter either with, with Dr. Weinberg either. Milton would come to the operating room and watch coronary surgery. I remember I was operating and doing coronary surgery. He said he wanted to see how it's done so that he could start doing coronary surgery. He did, but never developed, you know, significant interest in it or volume of surgery. And they decided to retire. Well, endovascular surgery is coming in strong. How the thoracic surgeons get prepared for the training or the endo technique? You have I, any really thought about can, that? I cannot uh, speak uh, authoritatively about endovascular grafting. I went to the meetings of endovascular from, you know, out west. Uh, they had a great meeting mm -hmm. there. I invited people from all over, including Parodi and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, people from France and so on. I never got involved in it. And, uh, but I saw with my own eyes, arch of the aorta and the three branches mm -hmm. done in, yeah. in, uh, percutaneously with excellent post-operative angiogram showing n perfectly yeah, normal right. aortic arch by a Japanese surgeon. So it's, um, it, there is no question that endovascular surgery has, by, has far passed the routine approach to, uh, to vascular surgery, surgical approach. Now, the majority of patients who have coronary artery disease, they have an, a stent in, insertion, and stents are used even for peripheral, peripheral arteries. And I think that's a major advancement in recent decades. But I was, I retired in 1997, that's what, 15 years ago? And during this period of time, endovascular surgery has soared skyward. Well, Hassan, we, we are very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would like to ask Bill to close our conversation. I have one question. We're, uh, the Javed shunt has been used throughout the world. Yes. Were um, you around when that? Uh, yes, I, not mm -hmm. only I was around, what is being used is the uh, final prototype. I'm so glad you brought that up. I was talking about Hushang Javed, I got, uh, you know, deviated to another uh, thought. I was going to mention that when uh, I came to St. Luke's, as I, as I said, I saw him do the aneurysm surgery. And then uh, in the new hospital, when we moved to uh, Rush Press St. Luke's, uh, there was a jar up there, uh, a tall jar, in which he had his uh, shunts 
but at the time they were they were not uh, of the type that you're talking about they were uh, what do you call it um, made of um, uh, plastic okay rigid plastic actually and he had to have it long enough so that he could make a make a half a um, what do you call it? Um, half a circle. Knot, mm -hmm. Half a circle or half a knot. It's in order to put one end in, of course, always the proximal end in first, and then put the, as it's bleeding, put the second one into the internal carotid artery. And with that shunt in place, then he would go ahead and open the incision and do endarterectomy and finally close it until there was very little left and then shunt is removed and the rest is done within a matter of a minute or so. And then he had V. Miller involved in the process. And it was V. Miller in Chicago that, um, that really um, uh, made the magnificent uh, elastic uh, shunts, mm -hmm. bigger at one end, smaller at the other end, end for internal carotid, and then in addition, at both ends, about maybe half an inch from each end, there was a bulge. There was, a, you know, there was a bulge so that you put it in and you had the, the tape uh, to keep it in place and you would pull it and you know that it's not going to come out because it's held in place with the bulge in the, in the shunt. You have used, did you I use have. it? So you know what I'm talking about. And then you put the second one in. And he developed clamps, two clamps that you would put on I remember that. Uh, and below and above. When I used it, I preferred just gentle, um, what do you call it, the tourniquet that I talked about at the two ends. There, you could put them aside as opposed to having the instrument. One of them had quite a knee. You could stand up, as you know. But Javits' contribution to cardiovascular surgery is immense and uh, especially in brachiocephalic surgery and uh, aortic aneurysm. The, before you um, the finish, I want to show you one patient. And the reason for showing the patient is this. I know that this, uh, the, what we are talking about, is a mm. expression, a wonderful expression from you and Jimmy and others towards me, and I'm grateful for it. And I consider it as one of the finest and one of the nicest compliments of my life. And I'm grateful for it. But I also want to say that along the way, taking care of patients, I became very close with many patients, especially patients that required repeated operation, repeated surgery. And that was, I finally ended up being a surgeon who would operate on the patient that someone else had already done it once or twice or three. And I didn't mind it because I had tremendous patience in doing surgery. Didn't get tired, remained focused. Now this lady here, uh, I've written her story and I'll show it to give it to you to look at it. The story is, the title is, Doctor, I love you, but I never want to see you again. <laughs> and this. <laughs> This is May Forsell. Her name is May Forsell, and was came to came to us, or came to my attention, with aneurysm of the proximal descending thoracic aorta, and we when we studied her, and the study always included coronary angiography, left ventriculography, and all the way down, so that you knew what was going on, and I came to do that because did a wonderful operation on a patient thoracic surgery without realizing patient had bilateral 95% obstruction of both renal arteries and she infarcted the kidneys in the process and my efforts did not do her any good. So in this patient when we had aneurysm here in the proximal descending thoracic aorta we did an angiogram and the angiogram showed aortic arch aneurysm involving the brachiocephalics. There was aneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta, and there was an aneurysm in the abdomen. But the others were not pressing, but the, the first one was. So I did the first, she came back, I did the second, which is aortic arch, 
and then did the third one, this distal descending thoracic aorta. The most difficult was when she needed to have the abdominal one done. And that was possible, and I read this to you because I want to pay tribute to both the patient mm -hmm. and another person that made this operation possible. Please bear with me. During the span of six years, a 67-year-old woman underwent four consecutive operations, ultimately replacing her entire thoracoabdominal aorta. The relatively uneventful postoperative course with each operation, one emergency and three elective procedures, and her current satisfactory condition at the age of 75 years, eight, year post eight years postoperative, have been attributed to her physical and mental fortitude, excellent anesthesia, superb postoperative care, and the chronic nature of her segmental aortic lesions caused by arteriosclerosis. Now, when I mention anesthesia, that man, a Russian man who came to be a resident, and we uh, appointed him, and the, the only Russian person who had been in, at Russia as a resident, he was unbelievably dedicated. And at the same time, he, he was also anesthesia resident, and he was also uh, extremely gifted. And I would have, have him reduce the patient's pressure to 70 and to do an anastomosis quickly and then bring it back up several times during the operation. And especially when I had to take a graph from the distal descending thoracic aorta and put it all the way down and attach the vessels. And I needed to him to bring the pressure down because no clamp would have stayed on the, as you know, on a large descending thoracic aorta with full pressure, it would have slided, slid off. And that made it possible. And that is May for sale. And that's the one who said, I never want to see you again. <laughs> and I <laughs> sympathize with her. And I hoped for the same thing. I need to ask you one more question. Tell me about playing ping pong with the Shah. Well, I was fourth year medical student in Iran. Uh, you became a doctor after six years in grade school, six years in high school, and six years in medical school. And I was now fourth year in high school. And um, I was, you, I, I remember vividly, in fact, I've written it up. I was studying pathology for pathology exam. And there was a knock on the door. And I went to the door and opened the door. And here is a man standing there and uh, looking at me. And I said, can I help you? He said, you are wanted at the palace, the summer palace of the king of Iran, to play ping pong with the Shah. <laughs> and I thought it was, uh, you know, a joke. At which time, on the left side, a, a fellow we step forward a little more, and he was the he was the coach, my coach of football. I mean, the ping pong. And when I saw Nick Nick now, I knew that this. I said, "Is he right?" He said, "Absolutely, get ready." And I th I wasn't ready. <laughs> we'll pick you up at five o'clock. So I ran to my mother and I said, "I'm asked to go to the palace to." Uh, play ping pong with Shah Iran. She said, come on, leave me alone. I'm very busy. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, mom, I'm telling you honest the fact. He said, come on. She wouldn't believe it. Finally, I said, I need money to get a pair of tennis shoes and a, and a pants, a flannel pants, because I didn't have proper attire to go. So she then realized I was right. She didn't have money. So she went across the street to the na two neighbors, got enough money, <laughs> brought it to me. I ran out and bought the pants and bought a pair of tennis shoes. At 5 o'clock, I was picked up. We went to the uh, summer palace of the king and uh, went down the stairs to the basement. And uh, I'm gonna, not going to mention some of the things that happened, which were funny. But finally, not only the king showed up, uh, the Soraya, his wife, was with him. And Soraya, King, uh, Queen Soraya, had a poodle, 
white poodle in her arms. So they all walked over, and I bowed and, uh, as you were supposed to. And finally, he, he said, um, I want you to play with, with the queen. And the queen looked at me and handed the poodle to the king, and I began to tremble. <laughs> <laughs> Went to the other side. They had two guys on each side to pick up the ball, uh, the, the, the ball and ping pong ball. And she started, you know, serving. The first one went into the net, second one was out. And after about a few minutes, she got flustered, put it, cracked it down. And in French told, when I could understand, like the French, said, I don't like it, I don't want to play. So she went back, got the pool, sat on the, uh, on the bench, uh, so far, and I said to myself, all of that effort was just for not. At which time the Shah said, well, I used to play this, but I'll give it a try. So he took his jacket off and he started playing. And uh, meanwhile, the guys rushed and brought him a pair of sh shoes and uh, ch changed his shoes. And we played for about maybe five or uh, six minutes. And he said, let's score. And, uh, and I said, okay. And so I started, you know, nice serve, another nice serve. And then when he would hit, and I would return it very gently over. He walked over halfway, and he said, you are an athlete. And the, uh, one of the things athletes learn very early in their stages of life is to do your best. You are playing to my hands, <coughs> and I don't like that. And I walked back, he walked back, he said, play your game. Whereupon I served four serves, he couldn't even see them. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me just like this. And I'm standing there wanting to laugh, but <laughs> I was morbid. He said, I asked for it, didn't I? <laughs> so why not just halfway? <laughs> just halfway. So we played, and we played for about 35, 40 minutes, which delighted me. And he was actually pretty good if you, you know, gave the ball, you know, nicely to him. So it was finished. At what time we put it down, and Soraya got up, and they, they left. And I brought, brought home. And, I, and I, everybody knew about it. They, this neighborhood and people, I mean, I received so many calls and so on. And I thought it was just that isolated. I wouldn't hear again. But we played every week for three and a half months or so. And the reason we stopped was because Mossadegh, you may remember the prime minister who uh, was um, against the Shah and against the, you know, there's a huge um, group. Mossad, there was an uprising in Tehran. And uh, people went to the palace. Some started going up the 12-foot fence, and King and his wife's life were in jeopardy, at which time a helicopter, you know, took him to uh, airport, and from there he went to Italy, and the ambassador from Iran to Italy would not allow him in, and a Jewish fellow found out, and he went to him and gave him his full checkbook. He said, I have plenty of money in Swiss, and he was in, in Italy. You please help yourself. And through that, that fellow became multi-billionaire because he got all of the uh, devices from there on that developed brought to Iran for, you know, commerce. So it was an amazing story. And uh, our, our interruption came because the king was, and after he came back from uh, Italy, he ran the country with an iron fist became an educated dictator and was king for a long time. I met him four other times, but unrelated to ping pong. Fascinating story. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.